thank you very much for the introduction. Um, and thank you to all of you participants that are here um, today and for the week. It's very nice to see all of you and or hear some of you um, or read your messages. So that's pretty cool. And um, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to um, share my work with you and also for um, organizing this and changing it into um, a form that we can all participate in at this time. Um, good. So yeah, so my first job is to tell you a bit about what the title means. Um, I want to apologize at the outset because um, if you're an expert, then the first half of my talk will contain no information. And if you're not an expert, then the first half of my talk may not help you understand anyway. It's mostly notation. Um, but in any case, hopefully you'll uh, get something out of this. All right, so all of this, all of the main results here um, are joint with Roman Bezrakovnikov and Simone Reich. All right, so, um, so the setup here is uh, geometric Langlands duality. Um, so I want to start with a pair of connected reductive groups that are Langlands dual to each other. Um, and this will divide all of my information into two sides. I'll have the G side and the G check side. So the G side for me will be the land of constructible sheaves. Um, so this is where our perverse sheaves live. Um, the type of geometry that I want to consider is that of the affine flag variety and the affine Grassmannian. I'll define those um, for you in a bit. And I want these varieties to be over the ground field F. Um, so this can be either the complex numbers, if you like, um, in which case you need to refine the Zariski topology to be the analytic topology. Um, at some point, it won't be explicit, but at some point it'll be necessary to switch to elatic sheaves, in which case we'll have to take our ground field to be FQ bar and use the ATAL topology. Um, so if you're an expert, you'll see where this happens, and if you're not, um, maybe you won't even notice. So just pretend everything is over the complex numbers um, for, for the constructible side. And then on the G-check side, this is where your representations live. So I want to think of this representations as an instance of um, equivariant coherent sheaves. Um, so the types of varieties that show up on this side are the Steinberg variety and the Springer resolution associated to the group G-check. Um, these varieties won't really play much of a role in the main theorem for today, but they're definitely um, motivating um, the work. And the ground field here is an algebraically closed field K, either characteristic zero or L. Um, and this K did show up on the G side, but we didn't see it. So this K was your uh, coefficient field. So if I was taking sheaves on the affine Grassmannian, I would want to take sheaves of K vector spaces. All right, so in the, the, in order to get our new results, we need to deal with the positive characteristic case here, um, in which case um, there are restrictions. And I think I'll just jump right in and tell you all the restrictions at the outset. And, um, and if you like, you can ask me questions about them at some point. All right, so, so, our groups G and G check come with some root data, um, the co-weights, the weights, the roots, the co-roots. Um, and because these are Langland's dual, this root data also gets associated to uh, the group G check um, in, in the obvious way. And so then the assumptions that I want is I want um, for my weights modulo my root lattice, I want this to be free. Um, so this, um, this assumption is the same as saying that G check has simply connected derived subgroup. Um, and then this other quotient, I want to ensure that it has no L torsion. Okay, so that's our assumption A1. Um, this assumption can be replaced um, by just requiring the prime to be very good. And then I have this other assumption here, um, where I want to assume the prime L is bigger than certain bounds according to the types that show up in your group. 
And if you look at type A, type C, D, E6, F4, G2, it looks like the bound wants to be um, a good prime. Um, and then the B, E7, and E8 violate that. So this, um, yeah, this restriction on the prime probably can be made better, but at this point it's, it is what it is. All right, I'm all about acceptance these days. So I've been thinking about the pros and cons of giving online talks um, because this is my first online talk. And uh, so a definite pro that I came up with right away is it doesn't matter what pants I wear, um, but a con is that I can't tell how my jokes are landing because there's literally no verbal response. So the timing is off, I apologize. Um, yeah, okay, so, so now we have the G side and the G check side. On the G check side, um, the main player is the centralizer of the regular unipotent element. So choose your regular unipotent element, take its centralizer. This is the group we want to consider. Um, if you're in SL3, here's what this group looks like. Um, so notice here that this group, you have the center of SL3 sitting inside here, and then you have some unipotent stuff. So that is a general fact. Um, so your centralizer contains the full center of your group plus some unipotent stuff. So in particular, um, if you are just thinking about representation theory and you want to know what the irreducibles are, um, the irreducibles are exactly corresponding to um, characters of your center. Good. Okay. What else? Right, so I said I wanted to think of representations as an instance of coherent sheaves. So this is what I mean by this. If I take the um, G check orbit of my regular unipotent element, and I call that U reg, um, then I can look at coherent G check equivariant coherent sheaves on this space. And this is equivalent to just considering representations of the centralizer. Okay. So the reason I'm mentioning this is because this category, representations of the centralizer, this is what's going to show up in the main theorem. But if, you, um, if you're someone who cares about representation, say, of G-check or the affine Hecke algebra or the affine Hecke category or whatever, you might say, well, why am I interested in this? Um, so here's the reason why you're interested in this. So this, um, this U-reg, under my assumptions for the characteristic, this is isomorphic to an open dense orbit of the nilpotent cone or an open dense orbit um, in the Springer resolution. And it turns out that these restriction functors, so I can restrict from the group G check to the centralizer, I can restrict representations, or I can restrict coherent sheaves on the nilpotent cone to the regular orbit or I can restrict coherent sheaves on the Springer resolution to the regular orbit. And it turns out that those restriction functors actually remember quite a lot of information about the original category. So those original three categories, um, those are the things that we really care about. Um, but it turns out that the, the restriction functor um, has nice properties that, that we'll eventually want to exploit. All right. Now on to the G side. So this is where the affine flag variety and the affine Grassmannian live. So these um, spaces are like flag varieties for loop groups. Um, so let's start with our ring O of power series and define for us an Iwahori. This is just the pre-image of a Borel in, in this group G of O. And then I can define these coset spaces, the affine flag variety, where I take um, the loop group of G modulo the Uahori and the loop group of G modulo the um, G of O. This gives me the affine Grassmannian. Um, so there's an obvious morphism for the, from the affine flag variety to the affine Grassmannian. So the fibers here will look like um, little G mod Bs. And so this is actually how I picture um, these spaces. So the affine Grassmannian, um, I have a sense of, I mean, probably a very 
misguided sense of what the space looks like. So this is an end projective variety. So it's growing. Um, I'm just tacking on bigger and bigger um, finite dimensional um, varieties to this. And then the affine flag variety is like a thing sitting on top of it where I've glued it together um, sort of W many times um, in some weird way. Um, yeah, so in any case, um, I want you to think of these as, as flag varieties, but infinite dimensional. Um, but there's only one, one problem with this, is your finite dimensional flag variety, G mod B or G mod P or whatever, it's always going to be connected. Um, and so this, because I'm dealing with this loop group here, that's not the case um, for these examples. So in general, these will have um, many connected components as many as the size of the fundamental group of your group G. Uh, I had a quick question. Is it okay to ask now or should I wait? Uh... Now it's a great time for a question. Okay, so uh, is there a version of the statements that you had on slide six for non-regular unipotents on G dual as well? Um, like uh, which statement? I mean, I could still consider coherent sheaves on the orbit. And if I take equivariant coherent sheaves, then I'll get representations of the corresponding centralizer. Um, yeah. But then it won't be it won't be um, an open dense sub variety of of the nilpotent cone or the Springer resolution, and I wouldn't expect the restriction functors there to have um, the same properties. Uh, yes. So, but would you get something related to like a partial like T star G mod P instead of T star G mod B? Or? So I have, so, um, yeah, so I'm not sure how to make sense of that question. Like I'm, um, you're saying, I guess what you're saying is if, so yeah, maybe our perspectives are backwards. Maybe that's what's going on. So from my perspective, I think that coherent sheaves on the Springer resolution and the null potent cone are interesting. So those are the categories that I care about. So if you say you cared about coherent sheaves on the cotangent bundle of say G mod P, then you're, you're asking, is there a corresponding statement, something that I can restrict to um, and still have nice properties to understand that bigger category? Yeah, maybe something like that, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I think the answer is probably yes. But I would have to think some about it um, because the reason I know this restriction functor has nice properties, um, there might be a statement that doesn't use this at all, but the statement that I know of like uses um, what is called an exotic T structure on this category. And I'd have to think about um, what the corresponding thing was for um, the cotangent bundle of a partial flag variety. Um, yeah, so maybe this is a better question to discuss say during the break to okay to cool better, thank you thank you yeah. um yeah okay any other questions all right back to the g side we have possibly many connected components ah okay so now um good so how do you visualize these creatures um, you visualize them, I said, similar to the way you would do G mod B. So for the affine flag variety, this is easier to see. If I want to count orbits by the Iwahori, um, then I follow in a very similar manner to, to the way I do for G mod B. I look at this, I find a Bruja type decomposition. I realize that this is indexed by the affine vial group rather than the finite vial group. And then if I actually want to understand the geometry of these orbits, then it's not too difficult to see that they actually have to be um, affine spaces because of the structure of the Iwahori. And then the dimension of these affine spaces um, is given by a length function for this affine vial group. So I, throughout this talk, I will say affine vial group, but what I mean by this is extended affine vial group. So here's some more notation. Yeah, so this is the finite vial group semi-direct product with um, my co-weight lattice for G. 
And now if you if you look at the affine Grassmannian, you could also build this up from Iwahori orbits, um, and then you will still get um, a cellular decomposition. But if instead you care about G of O orbits, these are sometimes called spherical orbits, um, you, you, uh, you won't get uh, contractible orbits now. Um, you'll get something a bit different, but now these are indexed by the dominant coates. Good. Okay. And so, um, yeah, so I want to consider constructible sheaves on the affine flag variety and the affine Grassmannian. So we'll deal with the affine flag variety first. Um, right, so I want to impose this condition of being I equivariant, which makes defining this category um, a bit more cumbersome. But the reason I want to do this is so that I can convolve these objects together. So I get this multiplication type operation. Um, and you can check that it's associative, it has a unit. So this allows me to think of the category of I equivariant sheaves on the affine flag variety um, as having a ring structure. Okay. And then, um, and then you might want to look at some perverse sheaves because this full derived category is um, big and and difficult. So the perverse sheaves give us an abelian subcategory. Um, and in some ways, they have a lot of properties that make them easier to understand. So one of these properties is the fact that we know, um, we know how to get all the simple perverse sheaves. So the simple perverse sheaves, the irreducible perverse sheaves are exactly indexed by my affine vial group. So I have one for each Iwahori orbit. Um, and it's a type of extension from that orbit to the orbit closure. So this is called a middle extension um, functor or an intersection cohomology functor um, that allows you to build a simple perverse sheaf um, just from the data of a constant sheaf on the, on the orbit. All right, but the caveat is if you just want to consider perverse sheaves, now this convolution operation um, is, is more difficult to work with because it's not going to preserve this property of being perverse. Okay, so now um, let's look at the affine Grassmannian case. Um, so in this case, again, we can take our full derived category. We can restrict ourselves to looking at perverse sheaves. The simple perverse sheaves are again given by this intersection cohomology construction. So they're, we have one for each orbit and in this case, the orbits are labeled by dominant weights. And I also have um, a convolution operation. All right. So in the same way for the affine flag variety, um, you can prove that this convolution is associative and it has a unit. Um, but you also get that this is commutative and it does preserve um, the property of being perverse. Um, so this allows some extra information um, on, on, on the affine Grassmannian side. So this is the geometric Satake equivalence. Um, in characteristic zero, this is essentially due to Lustig, but this works for any field of coefficients here, um, K, and that is due to Merkovich and Bolonen. So what this equivalence says is that this category of perverse sheaves together with its operation called convolution, that this behaves um, like a category of representations. Um, and this convolution acts like tensor product acts for, for representations. And so then you have to do all this work to identify which group shows up. Um, and it turns out um, that it's the, the Langland's dual group. Yeah, all right. So um, now I think I'll start talking about some categorifications. So this is, this is our first categorification, this geometric Satake. And it's a categorification of um, the Satake isomorphism. So instead of looking at perverse sheaves on the affine Grassmanni, and I could write this in a simpler manner by looking at um, functions on this double coset space, 
um, that are instead of a K here, I could put like C valued functions or something like this. And this is the, the spherical Hecke algebra. That's how it's usually defined. Um, and the Satake isomorphism says, well, that should be the same thing as the representation ring for, for G check. So geometric Satake is just a, a categorification of this isomorphism. And then um, we already mentioned um, the category of sheaves on the flag variety, on the affine flag variety. And this is what gives us the affine Hecke algebra. And so um, usually, so I don't know, there are two ways to think about Hecke algebras. Some people naturally think of them as functions on coset spaces, and some people think of them as defined in terms of generators and relations, and you have this uh, parameter Q that shows up. Um, so this parameter Q, um, when you're thinking about this as an algebra, this requires you to put this, this word mix here. So that's why this is here. Um, if I just take I equivariant sheaves on the affine flag variety and don't impose mix, then I still get um, a monoidal category. And now when I take the growth and deep group, I'm not going to get the affine Hecke algebra, but I'll get the group algebra of the affine vial group. All right, um, good. So this side also has a G check analog, um, which says that if I instead look at coherent sheaves on the Steinberg variety and take them G check equivariantly, and then I also want to get this parameter Q showing up. So I also take um, an action of the multiplicative group. Um, then the growth and deep group of this um, is also isomorphic to the affine Hecke algebra. Okay, so this is all, this won't play any role in what I'm saying today. This is just to make you care about the main statement. Um, yeah, and so, yeah, pretty remarkably, I mean, maybe it's not remarkable that it's true, but it's remarkable that it's written down is the fact that these categories are um, equivalent, and this is um, due to Bezrakovnikov um, when we're dealing with characteristic zero coefficients. Cool. All right, and a third categorification is the relation between these two. So I need um, the affine Hecke algebra, and then sitting inside there, I can take the center, um, and then Bernstein shows that the center of this ring is isomorphic to the spherical Hecke algebra. Cool. So at the level of categories, it says there should be some way to get from sheaves on the affine Grassmannian to sheaves on the affine flag variety. And there should be a way to get over there where you're respecting your multiplications. So um, a while back, I talked about this morphism from the affine flag variety to the affine Grassmannian. So a very naive guess would be, well, can I pull back along this morphism? And you'll see right away that this, this won't even give you um, a good ring morphism. Um, and so that's, that's not what Gatesbury does here. Um, instead, this construction uses uh, nearby cycles. OK? And so then um, once it's set up, um, he shows that this respects your convolution operation. Essentially, he can use this construction to define a convolution, um, takes units to units. And then the image of this functor um, is a central object in my uh, category of sheaves on the affine flag variety. All right. So maybe is this a good time for a break? It's a perfect time for a break. I was about to, <laughs> about to suggest. Okay, cool. I will allow everyone to unmute themselves if they want. And hopefully there will be a small discussion in the break. Yeah, maybe not. I haven't said too much yet. There's a Roman's theorem about the equivalence lifting of Categorical equivalence uh, lifting this cash and Lucy isomorphism. Is it true in, when K is not C? I mean, is it not true when K is not C? I mean, oh, I think it's just not written down um, for positive characteristic. Wait, what? It, wait, what is your question? Is your question whether if I take K equals to not C, 
does this uh, category of coherent sheaves decategorify to the affine Heck algebra, or is it equivalent to I equivariant sheaves on the affine flag variety? Yeah, the second thing. Yeah, so that is not written down. But it's believed to be true, is that what you're saying? Yeah, it's believed to be true. And maybe, maybe we'll hear something about it tomorrow during Roman's talk. Ah. I hope. Yeah, I'll mention something. I mean, I guess uh, what Laura is talking about is some of what she's talking about is a part of a joint project which is aimed at establishing this. So we expect this is true, maybe there's some restri restrictions on characteristic, but uh, the same proof doesn't quite go through, so one needs new ideas. Yes. Also, I mean, it's not a major point, but um, Lustig certainly made a major contribution, but to say, uh, but I don't think it's quite accurate to say that uh, the geometrics attack here with a uh, characteristic zero coefficients is due to him exclusively. There was also you don't think so? Well, I mean, there was this uh, paper, which is Q analogs of weight multiplicities, which certainly was a... He compute, yeah, he... he... He, yeah, he computed various numerical data, which shows that the um, cohomology is, in some sense, is identified with the representation, but there's still some way to go from that to an equivalence, which, you know, there was this preprint by Ginsburg, and then contributions by Drinford. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Oh, that's that's why uh, George had the update to uh, his Heck Algebra's unequal parameters book, where he does geometrics of Dake his way finally. Mm, okay. Was, when was that? Was that recently? Mm, the update? 2013. Okay, so that's recent. <laughs> okay, uh, ben, can you say it again? Which paper you are uh, referring to? Sorry, my microphone is, my internet is going in and out. Everyone's frozen right now, so I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> I was just asking someone to repeat uh, what paper Ben was. I, I was just saying like Lustig, uh, you know, I asked him a lot about this. You know, he basically did everything there is to do on the Grossendick group. Um, and yeah. that implies most of what's true categorically, except for the like commutation. Isomorph. Right. And, and um, yeah. You like w it didn't have the technology for that at the time, and then and then because of Zirkle by when Zirkle by modules became sort of available, um, with the with the Zirkle conjecture being proven, uh, he rewrote his Heck algebras with unequal parameters book to add a chapter in doing the commutation isomorphism. Oh, I see. like the one missing piece. So if you want to read it done his way, you can find it in the updated version, which is like 2014. I mean, oh, uh, so second second edition of an unequal parameter. We wait uh, maybe one more minute uh, in case people went out for a break and are coming back to not start before they're back. But then let me just go ahead and start as soon as that one last minute or fraction of a minute has lapsed. Can I ask a question? Yeah, so uh, I'm just a bit curious about where does this GM equivariancy come from? Uh, for the action on the Steinberg variety. Exactly, yes. You mean, how is it defined? No, 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 why, I mean, okay, I can see the G check equivariancy is a pretty natural thing to consider, yeah. but I was wondering why there's a, like an extra copy of GM. Yeah, so the, um, if I remove the GM, I still get a perfectly good category and it has like a convolution type operation. Um, but when I tack on the GM, this is the same as 
uh, if I'm thinking of modules over a ring and that ring secretly has a grading, this would be the same thing as just taking graded modules over that oh, ring. So if I want to get um, an algebra um, that can be defined not just over the integers, so your growth indie group is naturally an abelian right. group, but over the integers adjoin Q comma Q inverse, mm -hmm. um, then, then I let Q act by this twist by the GM action. Or maybe Q inverse, I don't know. So can we see this GM action on the side of, uh, of a hacker algebra? Mm -hmm. Was that a question or a statement? Oh, it was a question. So how do you see this GM action on the, on the alpha and hacker algebra side? Um, or can we see that? I still don't know if I understand the question. Can you speak more slowly? Uh, okay, so can, we see, so can we see this GM action correspond to something um, on the alpha and hacker algebra side? So the affine hacker algebra typically is defined um, as an algebra over Z adjoin uh, like polynomials in Q and Q inverse, mm -hmm. right? So this, right. Action, this action of Q is what corresponds to the extra GM here. Okay, I see. That's just a question. Okay, thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Do we go on with the talk? Okay, great. Um, good. Yeah, this is where I was. Okay, so, um, right. So now we have to link the two sides together and the pieces have been shown to you. So what matches with the centralizer of a regular unipotent element? Okay, so, um, so take your category of perverse sheaves on the affine flag variety. And now I wanna define a SARE quotient. So I want to quotient by all simple objects, um, so that my label, my vial group element has length greater than zero. Okay, so if you think about this just for a bit, what does this mean? This means I'm, I'm removing simple objects whose support has positive dimension. So all I have left, the only irreducibles that I have left here are the skyscraper sheets. I have a skyscraper for each connected component of the affine flag variety. All right, so that's the main property that this category has that's easy to see is that the number of irreducibles in this category are now exactly the same as the number of connected components of the affine flag variety, um, which is the same as the size of the fundamental group. And if I'm thinking I want to connect this to the Langlands dual side. This is going to be the same as the number of irreducible characters for the for the center. Okay, so this is my category. Um, and I can also define an operation on it um, using convolution. So take take two objects in this category, um, F bar, G bar, take any lifts of them um, to perverse sheaves on the flag variety, convolve them there. This is not going to be perverse in general. So then take perverse cohomology and then look at the image um, in this quotient category. Okay, and so this operation, while it's a mouthful to explain to you how it's defined, um, has all of these nice properties. Um, so, and they're really not that difficult to check. Um, the fact that this is um, an associative um, operation and is well defined essentially follows from the fact that um, I can think of this SARE subcategory as being an ideal in the appropriate sense under um, convolution by the full, full derived category. Yes. So this is, um, this is my category and its operation. Um, it looks like it should be representations of something, and um, and it is. So that's that's the the main theorem. So assume my field K satisfies the earlier assumptions, um, then this category is equivalent to representations of the centralizer of the regular unipotent element in the Langlands dual group. Um, yeah, and I'll remind you what those assumptions are here. 
Um, so hopefully um, this property A2 can be improved to just be good primes, but um, I'll mention in a bit um, how this comes about. All right, so let me tell you a few ingredients here. So the first ingredient is um, this category with its operation looks like I should apply Tanakian formalism, um, but I don't want to try to define a fiber functor. And so instead I avoid all that by using um, prior work of Bezrakovnikov. So the main idea is to study this functor. So um, the Z bar. So I go from representations to perverse sheaves on the affine Grassmannian. and this is my geometric Sataki equivalence. And then I use gates Gorey's nearby cycles functor to get to perverse sheaves on the affine flag variety. And then I take my quotient. Um, and you can study this functor and see that it behaves like a restriction functor should. And so this is what gives you um, a subgroup of G check uh, to get an equivalence with. So maybe a few more details. Um, what does behaves like a restriction functor mean? Um, what do we need to check here? Um, so this means, um, of course, I want it to be exact, but I also want it to be central. So that includes that I want it to respect the monoidal structures um, and behave nicely um, with respect to all of that. And then the third thing is sort of, uh, it's sort of like a faithfulness property of the functor. Um, I want to show that any object in my target category um, can be produced as a subquotient um, from a representation. Good, so that's the work there. So now we have a subgroup of G-check. Um, next, uh, we want to find a centralizer to put it in. So this comes from this nearby cycles formalism. Um, and this also really isn't anything new. This was already understood um, by Roman a long time ago um, and gates Gorey, I guess, too. Um, so this nearby cycles construction uh, comes with um, a monodromy automorphism of the functor. So, um, so this gives you an element of the group and you can show um, that this, this monodromy automorphism is actually unipotent. Um, and so this gives us that H lives inside of a centralizer of a unipotent element. All right, so next we need that this uh, unipotent element is regular and this is um, kind of technical uh, and I don't think I want to try to explain this right now. Um, but in any case, um, the, the, the main idea here is you study some extensions of, of Wakimoto sheaves. You have to um, show that certain extensions exist. Um, if I'm just looking at um, Iwahori equivariant things, um, yeah, I think that's all I'm going to say about that, but feel free to ask questions later on um, about it. Okay, and then, um, and then the final thing is we need to show that um, H is the full centralizer. Um, and so this boils down to, to studying tilting objects. Okay, um, yeah, so I think both part one and part four involves studying tilting objects. So I'll say just a little bit more about that and then I'll be done. Um, yeah, so to do this, I have to introduce um, the anti-spherical module. So this should have been categorification number four on my categorification slide, um, but I didn't include it. Um, maybe Roman will say more about, about this, I'm not sure, but the, um, Categorical version of this is that I can construct another quotient of perverse sheaves on the affine flag manifold that I want to call the anti spherical category. So this time I'm quotienting out by simple objects whose label is not minimal in their coset representative, where I'm modding out by the finite file group. 
So this is um, now if I'm if I'm doing my counting thing, how many irreducibles does this have? Um, well, the irreducibles will be indexed by W, the affine vial group modulo W, or um, just co-weights. All right. So um, yeah, so I can also factor my central functor. I can just stop at this anti-spherical category. Um, and, and this is what I want to study here to get information about the tilting objects. So the first thing um, that I want to note, this is not obvious um, to me, but it's, uh, but it's true. The anti-spherical category has another realization. So this is obvious at the decategorified level, but as far as categories go, um, it takes a bit more. So the other realization of this anti-spherical category is in terms of what are called Iwahori-Whitaker sheaves. So um, that could be a talk for another day. Um, this category is awesome, I think. Um, and the, the main reason it's awesome is because if I take a quotient here, I have no idea what, what this category looks like anymore. I can't compute X groups or anything. Um, the only thing I really know how to do is say like, oh, well, how many irreducibles do I have? And, uh, and that's as far as I get. But when you look at these Iwahori Whitaker sheaves, um, it's really, really easy to see sort of the basic structure here that this is a highest weight category, you know, some standard objects, co-standard objects and all of that business. Um, yeah, good. So that's the main fact. Um, and then the other fact is that now if I start with tilting representations and follow them through, um, then they end up being tilting in this anti-spherical category. So this is um, having control of these tilting objects is, is essentially how we're able to prove um, those bits on the previous slide. And um, yeah, and this is exactly where those sort of worse restrictions come in for the characteristic because of the way that this is proved. So I haven't said anything about um, tilting objects in a category or tilting representations. But I can tell you some easy tilting representations. Um, I could take the trivial G-check representation. That one's tilting. I could take one with a minuscule highest weight. That one is also tilting. Um, and so those are easy to see that they have to go to tilting things. And then I could also take uh, the, um, the tilting representation I want to say it's called quasi minuscule or um, I want to say that that's the word that is used, but I feel like there's more than one word that's used. So I think I might be getting confused. So this one, I can tell you the property that it has as a representation. So the weights, you have your highest weight and you have the full vial group orbit of that highest weight. And then you have one extra weight, which is zero. So that's what this representation looks like. Um, and so it's also easy to check that that has to go to something tilting um, as long as you make some assumptions on your characteristic. Um, and, then, and then you want to know that all of the other tiltings that you get, course, they come from tensor products of these easy ones. Um, and so that also requires this restriction on the characteristic. Okay, so that's all I want to say about tiltings. And um, those are the main things that I want to say. Um, so, yeah, so if, if you like all of this and you think it's really interesting and cool and want to know more, then um, you should go to Roman's talk tomorrow. And, um, and yeah, thanks for listening. Sorry for ending a little early. No problem. I will allow all the participants to unmute themselves in case they have questions. Laura? Yes. I was wondering, um, there's this like theorem of, old theorem of Ginsburg where this centralizer of the principal unipotent also uh, plays a role. You know, it's a kind of version of derived geometric satake. Is it related to the appearance of this centralizer of the principal unipotent here? Wait, wait, wait. Say, say the original statement again of Ginsburg? Uh, I would have to remember it carefully, but I think it says that, um, 
harm between uh, harm between two IC sheaves on the fine yeah. grass monument. In the fine grass mining and in the drive category, not just the abelian category, in the drive category is the same as hum between the corresponding representations, but as representations for the universal centralizer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this, I would say this is sort of causal dual to um, our main theorem, whatever that means. Um, so that main theorem tells you um, a relationship between, say, uh, D of O constructible sheaves on the affine Grassmannian and coherent sheaves on the nilpotent cone. So that's the relationship there. And then, um, yeah, restriction to the regular orbit would correspond to taking this total HOM instead of um, your usual well, fiber functor. So, in what sense is your category causal dual to the? Constructible sheaves on G of O, like very constructible sheaves in that kind of I don't know how to say a quotient category is causal dual to anything, but the, in in our equivalence, we expect it to lift to an equivalence of of billion categories between, um, yeah, this Iwahori Whitaker perverse sheaves or this anti spherical module. That should be equivalent to um, exotic sheaves on the Springer resolution. And I could further quotient this, I could further quotient this um, instead of taking uh, these left cosets, I could take double coset, things that aren't minimal and they're double coset, and then instead of getting things for the Springer resolution, I would get things for the nilpotent cone. But this will be an exact equivalence. It'll take perverse sheaves to perverse coherent sheaves, whereas this other equivalence where I'm working with the affine Grassmannian, um, is not exact. It's it's switching, um, switching like simple objects and, or I want to say parity sheaves and tilting objects, but I don't know how how different people think about causal duality these days. In, in type A, you can really see the causal duality uh, if, if you use sort of like um, a swapping potential and actual polynomial. Uh, I can explain it to you later. <laughs> if you like yification of complexes and things like that. Cool. Other questions? Uh, so this is perhaps a repeat of Joel's question a little bit, but um, I was, so another way, possibly the same way of, of seeing this regular centralizer group scheme would be something like, well, the coordinate ring of like the, the full group scheme of regular centralizers is the equivariant homology of the affine Grassmannian. Yeah. So you could think about like representations of that. So that's co-modules for, for that algebra uh, as, as something like some category of local systems on the, on the affine Grassmannian. Uh, and so, yeah, I was wondering if somehow these stories could tie in together a little bit. In particular, maybe I'm, I'm curious about why your story is all about the flag variety and not the Grassmannian. Because in causal duality, uh, uh, yeah, why is it about the affine flag variety and not the affine Grassmannian? It's, so with the affine Grassmannian, I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I don't know a good short answer for this. I, I mean, I want to play this game where if you take the loop group, and then I mod out by certain things on one side and the other, then those get swapped with things um, under causal duality. And one one thing that gets swapped is um, a certain type of equivariance with this um, Whitaker type condition. Um, but I don't think that really answers your question. No, I think can I, I think I think this is exactly the answer because uh, so shifts on Grassmannian, Grassmannian means you take geo four equivariance and this causal duality swaps as geo four equivariance with some sort of spherical with anti spherical which can be phrased as swapping geo four equivariance with Whitaker or Whitaker equivariance. So 
this way and when we apply Kazil Dai to, think, to things coming from Grassmanian, we get this Lahore with the text. Yeah. I see. Cool. Thanks. Um, can I ask about the theorem? Does it does it imply that um, that if you take um, a map between you know gate square central shoes or something and you restrict it just to this pi zero quotient that that this this is like in any sense fully faithful or faithful? If you um, if I start with object, Not so if I start with the Iwahori Whitaker category or the anti spherical category. And then I, I was going to start even earlier with the representation. I know. And so I don't know what the answer is earlier. Right. Because something, yeah. So I know for sure that if you start with tilting objects in the Iwahori Whitaker category, um, for instance, those would be the central, uh, central sheaves corresponding to the tilting representations. And then mm -hmm. I look at the quotient that that will be fully faithful on those tilting objects. Fantastic. And what, I, what I don't know is whether the HOM between those, um, yeah, between those central sheaves, whether that's the same on the full, in the full affine HECA category. Right, okay. Thank you. Yeah, so maybe I should have mentioned that. That was part of the motivation for this, is to sort of try to repeat some Sergal-esque um, approach to understanding category O, but for understanding the affine HECA category. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you move to the slides with definition of PI0? I just forgot about the definition. Um, yes. Here, here's the definition. Can you explain why, is there an intuitive reason why PI0 is commutative, the tensor product? Well, the, like a naive way to say it is, well, my simple objects are these skyscraper sheaves. And so uh, those will commute with each other. And then things that are composition factors of them, I guess, should commute with each other. But then I, I thought the quotient of ICW already quotient of everything, right? Almost everything. Almost yeah. everything, yeah. Uh, this W is a finite wide group element, right? No, 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 no. Anything in the affine, I, I should, maybe I should have written that. Any IC labeled by W in the affine vial group such that the length is bigger than zero. I see. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Um, there's no other questions. Uh, we can. Uh, oh, there's one other question. Laura, is, is it clear in the end that that this functor also makes indecomposable tilting objects to indecomposables? Oh, good question. Um, here, you mean here, where I'm looking at the image of these tiltings in the anti-spherical category? Yes. I don't know that it's clear. I remember talking about it with Simone and Roman and and I think we showed this and I can't exactly remember uh, in the end whether we did or not, whether we were able to do like a HOM computation that showed that those had to be in decomposable. Um, but I can check and, and yeah, give you a better answer. Okay. Um, there's no more questions. I will, um, well, thank you, Laura, very much for this wonderful talk. Um,